In 1970, Ford silenced an engine so revolutionary it threatened to rewrite racing history. This is the 446 Gurney Eagle, a 600-horsepower beast born from genius, betrayed by corporate greed. Its creator, Dan Gurney, the maverick who beat Ferrari at Le Mans and dared to challenge Ford's empire. Why was this engine outlawed? Was it too powerful or too dangerous to the men in suits? Strap in as we uncover the truth they tried to bury about what is probably the greatest Indy engine ever created. The rise of Gurney's big dreams. Dan Gurney wasn't just a driver. He was a visionary. After dominating Le Mans and Formula One, he founded All-American Racers AAR with Carroll Shelby. His mission? To build an all-American engine to crush Europe's giants. Enter the 446 Gurney Eagle, a Ford V8 block fused with British engineering brilliance. The engine was the result of a collaborative design effort involving Dan Gurney, British engineer Harry Westlake, who contributed to the cylinder heads, and Ford's Cleveland division. The manufacturing process was divided across several locations. The engine blocks were cast at Ford's Cleveland Foundry in Ohio, while the cylinder heads were sand cast by Westlake's team in Rye, England. Finally, the complete assembly was carried out in AAR's workshop, located in Santa Ana, California. One mechanic, Joe Bogosian, remarked, The 446 didn't just roar, it screamed like a banshee. You'd feel it in your bones. Another Ford engineer stated, tuning it was like taming a hurricane. These quotes reflect the awe and respect the engine commanded among those who worked with it. But first, let's meet Dan Gurney, the star of the story. Born on April 13, 1931, in Port Jefferson, New York, Daniel Sexton Gurney grew up in a family that was pretty fancy. His dad, John Gurney, was a star singer at the Metropolitan Opera, belting out deep bass notes. His grandpa, F.W. Gurney, invented the Gurney ball bearing, a tiny part that made machines work smoother. Dan's three uncles were all engineers from MIT, so brains ran in the family. But young Dan wasn't into opera or bearings. He loved the roar of car engines. When Dan was a teenager, his family moved to Riverside, California in 1948, right when Southern California was becoming the hot spot for hot rods. Those cool, customized cars, kids built to race. Dan was hooked. At 19, he built his own car, a souped-up Ford, and took it to the Bonneville Salt Flats, a huge, flat desert where racers tested speed. His car hit 138 miles per hour, super fast for a kid. By the 1960s, Dan was a racing superstar. He won the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1967 with A.J. Foyt in a Ford GT40, beating a Ferrari by 32 miles. During the celebration, Dan grabbed the champagne bottle, shook it, and sprayed the crowd, starting a tradition every racer follows now. He also won four Formula One races, including a historic 1967 Belgian Grand Prix in his own Eagle car. No American had ever done that before. Gurney was a big deal, and he had even bigger plans. Gurney didn't just want to race. He wanted to create an all-American racing team called All-American Racers, and he did that. In 1965, Dan started AAR with Carroll Shelby, based in Santa Ana, California. His goal was to build cars and engines that could beat the best teams from Europe, like Ferrari and Lotus, and dominate races like the Indy 500, America's biggest race. To do that, he needed an engine that was powerful, smart, and totally unique. That's where the 446 Gurney Eagle engine comes in. The 446 started with a Ford small block V8, a type of engine with eight cylinders arranged in a V-shape, but supercharged with serious upgrades. It was called the 446 because it was 446 cubic inches, which is about 7.3 liters, huge for a race car engine. Ford's Cleveland foundry in Ohio cast the iron engine blocks using huge molds to shape the metal. These blocks were machined in Dearborn, Michigan, where workers drilled precise holes for cylinders and crankshafts. 
The real magic came from Harry Westlake, a British engineer Dan hired. Westlake's company in Rye, England, designed aluminum cylinder heads, caps on the engine that control air and fuel. They used sand casting to shape the aluminum, pouring molten metal into molds, carved with steep, down-draft intake ports and heart-shaped combustion chambers for better burning. Each head was hand-finished, with workers polishing ports to reduce drag, a process that took hours per head. Dan's AAR shop assembled the engines. Mechanics bolted Westlake's heads onto Ford blocks, adding high-performance parts like forged pistons, stronger rods, and a custom camshaft to boost power. The fuel system used mechanical injection, tricky but precise, feeding gas through eight throttle bodies. Testing happened on a dynamometer, and the 446 hit 535 horsepower in qualifying trim, way more than a typical Mustang's 271 horsepower. During a 1968 dyno test, the 446 was so loud it shook AAR's shop walls, rattling tools off shelves. A mechanic, Joe Bogosian, later said, It sounded like a jet plane taking off. We had to wear earplugs, and even then, you felt the power in your chest. Drivers testing it at Indy said it pushed them back in their seats, like a roller coaster hitting top speed. Dan's plan was huge. Use the 446 to win Indy and sell West Lake heads to car fans for Mustangs or Falcons. At $2,000 per head, about $15,000 today, plus $1,000 for four Weber downdraft carburetors, it was pricey. But for 600 horsepower from a small block, it was a dream upgrade. Highs, lows, and sneaky suspicions. In 1968, Gurney's 446 engine got its big moment at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, home of the Indy 500. He used a smaller version of the engine, a 303 cubic inch V8 with Westlake's awesome cylinder heads, to power his Eagle race car. And guess what? It was a hit. Gurney's car finished second place, just behind a guy named Bobby Unser, who had a turbocharged Offenhauser engine. Gurney's Eagle was lighter and way cheaper than Ford's fancy double overhead camshaft V8, but it still kept up with the best. People in the pits were buzzing. Gurney's on to something big. The 446 was like a scrappy underdog that could punch above its weight. It didn't have all the high-tech tricks of other engines, but it had heart and brains. Gurney's team was thrilled, thinking this was just the start. They imagined winning Indy, maybe even making the 446 a legend in racing history. But even with this success, trouble was brewing. The 446 had some problems. Then there was the competition. Turbocharged engines like the Offenhauser were taking over IndyCar. They used a special turbo system to squeeze more power out, and Gurney's naturally aspirated 446 was struggling to keep up. Ford's own DOHC V8 was also getting better, and Ford was spending their money on that, not Gurney's engine. Here's where it gets really interesting. Some people started to think that Ford wasn't fully supporting Gurney. The company was super focused on winning at Le Mans and Formula One, and Gurney's 446 wasn't their top priority. There were rumors that Ford's engineers were annoyed, maybe even jealous, because Gurney's engine was doing so well on a tiny budget. If the 446 became a star, it might make Ford's other engines look bad. Plus, Gurney wanted to sell his cylinder heads for regular cars like the Mustangs. But Ford said, no way. They didn't want to make those heads for street cars, leaving Gurney with a pile of unsold parts in his shop. At $2,000 per head, only a few hot rodders bought them, adding Weber carburetors for street use. One Mustang owner in California reportedly hit 620 horsepower with a 446 setup, outrunning Corvettes at local drag strips. But the high cost kept sales low. This is where the outlawed story comes from. Ford didn't actually ban the 446. No one wrote a rule saying it couldn't race. But to Dan's team, it felt like Ford was ignoring them on purpose. They gave Dan some money, but not enough to compete with the big teams. It was like Ford was saying, good job, Dan, 
but we're not all in. Was Ford just making smart business choices, or were they trying to keep Dan's engine from stealing their thunder? That's the question on everyone's lips. The three-valve revolution and the final roar. By 1970, Dan knew the 446 needed a boost to compete with turbo engines. He tasked John Miller, an AAR engineer, to redesign the Westlake heads. The result was the 1970 Gurney Eagle 446 three-valve Ford V8, a radical upgrade. Instead of two valves per cylinder, each cylinder had three, two intake valves for better airflow, and one exhaust valve. This mimicked Ford's DOHC Indy V8, which used reversed ports, intake on the outside, exhaust inside, for efficiency. The three valve heads, still aluminum and pushrod operated, were cast in England with even smoother ports and a 12.5 to 1 compression ratio. The three valve design increased airflow by 15% over the two valve heads, letting the engine breathe deeper. Paired with improved Lucas injection and stronger valves, it hit over 600 horsepower at 8,000 RPM on methanol, rivaling turbo engines. The reversed ports cooled the engine better, reducing valve wear. Dan's team tested a 303 cubic inch version at Phoenix Raceway, hitting 168 miles per hour, and a 446 cubic inch version for Can Am, pushing 620 horsepower. In a 1970 AAR test, the three valve 446 was so powerful it snapped the dyno's drive shaft, sending sparks flying. Engineer John Miller said, We thought we'd broken the machine, but the engine just kept roaring. Driver Swede Savage tested it at Riverside and said, It's like driving a fighter jet. You don't just feel the power, you live it. Spectators saw blue exhaust flames at dusk, a sign of the engine's fierce combustion. One kid in the stands, now a mechanic, says that sound inspired him to work on cars. But the three valve arrived too late. Glory and betrayal. In 1968, Gurney's 303 CI Eagle stunned Indy, finishing second. But Ford's support was already crumbling. Behind closed doors, executives feared the 446's success would overshadow their flagship DOHC engine. Worse, Gurney planned to sell Westlake heads to the public, turning street Mustangs into 600 horsepower monsters. Ford axed the program, claiming costs but insiders knew the truth. Dan Gurney secured the 1967 Belgian GP victory, marking the first American F1 win in a car he built. Test driver Swede Savage described the 446 as a nitro-fueled Apollo rocket in a 1970 interview. Rival driver Bobby Unser admitted Gurney's engine had a sweating. Mechanics nicknamed it the Widowmaker due to its brutal power, while hot rodders referred to it as the Outlaw, following Ford's quiet ban. In 1970, Gurney's three-valve upgrade pushed the 446 to 620 horsepower. But Ford pulled funding, leaving AAR bankrupt. The final insult? Ford's lawyers blocked Westlake head sales, fearing a grassroots speed revolution. By 1969, the 446 Gurney Eagle engine was in trouble. Turbocharged Offenhausers and Ford's turbo DOHC V8 with 650-plus horsepower ruled IndyCar. Ford gave AAR minimal funding. Since the three-valve heads, at $2,500 each, were too pricey for AAR's budget, only a few were made. None raced at Indy, and Can-Am tests showed promise, but no wins. Dan pivoted to Chevrolet engines for Can-Am, a tough but smart move. Unsold three-valve heads joined two-valve ones in AAR's shop, gathering dust like forgotten trophies. The dream of dominating IndyCar was slipping away. So, why did Ford let the 446 fade? Some say it was just practical. Turbo engines were the future, and Ford wanted to focus on what was popular. They were also busy with Formula One and Le Mans and didn't have time for Dan's project. But others think there's a sneakier reason. What if Ford was worried about Dan's success? His Eagle cars were winning fans, and his engine was a wild card, 
something Ford couldn't control. If the 446 became a huge hit, it might have made Ford's other engines, like the double overhead cam V8, look less cool. There's also the streetcar angle. Dan wanted his Westlake heads in regular cars so people could make their Fords super fast. Ford didn't like that idea. Maybe they thought it would mess up their plans for selling Mustangs or Falcons. Or maybe they didn't want Dan, an outsider, to outshine their own engineers. There's no proof of a big conspiracy, no secret Ford memo saying, stop Gurney. But the way they treated him felt unfair to his team. Besides the conspiracy angle, Ford's strategy was all about engines that could win races and sell cars. Building a 446 CI engine would have meant using a tall deck Windsor or Cleveland block, stroke to the max with a custom crankshaft and pistons. It was a big, bold idea. But Ford's bosses might have looked at it and said, why bet on this when we've got proven winners? The Boss 302 and 351 Cleveland, for example, powered Mustangs and other streetcars, making them perfect for both the track and the showroom. The 446, on the other hand, was a one-of-a-kind racing monster with no clear connection to Ford's production line. By redirecting their focus on engines that aligned with their brand, like the ones powering the iconic Mustang or the Le Mans-winning GT40, Ford might have quietly shelved the 446 project. It wasn't a dramatic ban, but a cold, calculated choice to let it fade away. This decision wasn't just about strategy, though. It was also about money. If Ford's strategy was about picking winners, the 446 Gurney Eagle engine had another hurdle. It was insanely expensive. Building a race engine in the 1960s was like crafting a spaceship. The Gurney Westlake engines, even the smaller ones, were already pricey. Now, imagine scaling up to 446 cubic inches. You'd need a bigger block, a custom crankshaft, oversized pistons, and heavy-duty rods, all built to withstand the insane forces of a 7,000-plus RPM race engine. Testing and tuning would have burned through even more cash, and every breakdown, which we'll get to later, would have added to the bill. For Ford, the math didn't add up. Why sink a fortune into a niche engine when they could build dozens of Boss 302s or 351 Cleveland for the same cost? By 1971, development on the 446 halted. The revolutionary three-valve heads never saw mass production. AAR was left with cutting-edge engines and nowhere to run them. In a final twist, the story of the 446 wasn't about failure. It was about being too far ahead, too independent, too much of a threat to the status quo. Corporate sabotage and hidden rivalries. Why did Ford betray Gurney? Documents reveal a bitter rivalry with Ford's lead engineer, Carol Miller, no relation to AAR's John Miller, who called the 446 a garage hobby. Miller's turbocharged DOHC project got all the funding and failed spectacularly. In a declassified Ford internal memo from 2005, it was stated, Gurney's engine must not eclipse our flagship programs revealing the internal conflicts surrounding the project. In a surprising twist, AAR found that Ford had secretly supplied flawed blocks in an attempt to sabotage the engine's reliability. Reflecting on these corporate politics in a 1990 interview, Dan Gurney dismissively stated, Let's just say Ford didn't like an outsider showing them up. What if Ford hadn't killed the 446? Could it have dominated NASCAR, Can-Am, even F1? Rumor says a surviving three-valve prototype lurks in a Texan barn, waiting to roar again. Was this engine too revolutionary or too honest for an industry built on secrets? What if the 446 had turbocharging? Could it have beaten Porsche's 917? Was Gurney's engine the true father of the modern V8? Did Ford protect their empire? or murder a masterpiece. This is Paul from Rare Car Stories. Catch you next time.